So the big question about institutions, meaning something like the rule of law or, or corruption or, or how you run your politics, is do, do, do better institutions, institutions that are more inclusive, institutions that give stronger rights to more people, do they lead to higher GDP? Do they lead to prosperity? Or is it the other way around? Just because you're, you're prosperous, you're richer, do you choose to have stronger rule of law? Or maybe there's some third variable that affects both GDP per capita and institutions. So in, in the work that I did with Ron Estemoglu and Jim Robinson, the work that won the Nobel Prize, we looked back into colonial history and we tried to understand where did modern institutions come from for countries that were taken over by the Europeans. Because the Europeans took over a large part of the world or had sway over much of the world. The Europeans had very similar expectations, hopes and ambitions in different places. The Europeans were, I mean, frankly, in it for themselves. They wanted to make money. They wanted to get their hands on some cheap resources. They wanted to run the world in, in, in a way that favored themselves. But the Europeans did very different things in different places because when they showed up in West Africa or the West Indies or uh, North America or Australia, they found that the conditions uh, relative to disease and health were quite different. If you sent a thousand Europeans to West Africa around about 1800, 500 of them would die in the first year. That's a shockingly high death rate. And in the second year, even more of them would die. If you sent the same hundred to Australia, and remember Australia was a penal colony in the early 1800s, then the uh, death rate uh, from disease was about the same as it was for the same people if they'd stayed behind in Europe. So Australia was a relatively healthy place for Europeans to go. And in, in places like that, more Europeans went. Those places competed to bring Europeans, and they did that by offering relatively inclusive institutions, at least for the Europeans, not sadly for the indigenous people. Places where the Europeans couldn't go because it was so unhealthy, they didn't bother to build inclusive institutions. They built something that people call extractive institutions. So that was all about get the money out, enrich a small elite, which could have been uh, Europeans or it could have been local people who were allied with the Europeans. And, and that was the basis of the slave trade. That was the basis of the plantation economy. Uh, that was the basis of other really unpleasant extractive uh, societies and institutions. And so what we found in our work is that those, those early decisions by the Europeans, those early institutions that were built, be they more inclusive or more extractive, they've persisted to a remarkable degree. Now, history is not predestination. You can still make choices. Uh, when these countries became independent, they could, and some of them did choose different paths. But unfortunately, a lot of them have stayed on a path that was set by that colonial experience. And that colonial experience with institutions was set by the disease conditions that the Europeans experienced. So at least in the sample of colonial countries, which is pretty big and broad and spans a lot of the modern world, what we find is that early institutions affected modern institutions. Modern institutions have an effect on income per capita. Again, you can escape that legacy. You can work hard and, and build a better economy. You can have more uh, shared prosperity. But if you're coming from a legacy of extremely extractive institutions, then finding your way onto a path of genuinely shared prosperity is pretty difficult. And a lot of countries around the world, frankly, perhaps up to 100 such countries, uh, have really struggled in, in, in recent decades. And th those struggles continue today. Well, I think with regard to institutions, the most interesting direction is to really understand at the country level what matters, uh, what can be changed, and, and what's more difficult to change. And, and, and then trying to uh, work with governments to, to discover patterns of institutions and patterns of uh, arrangements that will reduce corruption, that will make it easier for private business to flourish, that will make sure wages actually rise. So we do a lot of work uh, at MIT on industrialized countries and we work on technology and shared prosperity. But the same thing's true of, of middle income countries and lower income countries. Um, irrespective of your institutions level, there is a real need to make sure that as many people as possible do better and, and feel like they're going to do better in, in, in any economy. Otherwise, you get backlash. Otherwise, people feel like they're left behind. Otherwise, people uh, get angry. And this is a big part of we, what feeds populism. So working on technology and working on institutions, to me, is just two sides of the same coin. And, and we, we try to do both uh, at, at MIT. The first work we did, the earlier work, was more focused on institutions. But of late, we've been more focused on technology. And bringing these things together and attempting to help people build better solutions that are really uh, resilient and feasible in particular institutional settings, that, that's the focus of the work now.